Welcome back to our Intermediate Financial Accounting class. In our last segment, we introduced the topic of long-term debt or long-term liabilities. We talked about why this topic is so important for investors as a key indicator of how a company is doing. We also talked about some of the elements that long-term debt has and then some differences between US GAAP and IFRS. Now it's time to talk about some specific examples. And although I wish we could talk about all the different kinds of long-term debt, we're going to have to restrict our discussion to just two. And that is our bonds payable and long-term notes. Now we've talked about both of these before from an asset standpoint. What happens when we invest and buy a bond? What happens when we decide to loan money to somebody else? But now we're talking about the flip side. We are borrowing the money. From our perspective now, bonds mean that we are going to make a series of interest payments and then a big lump sum payment at the end. And long-term notes payable mean that we will get the money now, we'll accrue a bunch of interest and make one huge payment at the end that includes all the principal and all the interest. Or that we make payments every single period that include a bunch of interest and a little bit of principal. At least that's how it feels if you're making a car payment or mortgage payment, is that there's really not much principal involved in these payments. The good news is, is that the rules for long-term debt are pretty similar. So if you're comfortable with how to treat bonds and how to treat at least one kind of long-term note payable, you should be able to easily apply those concepts to any other kinds of long-term debt that you have the opportunity to deal with. So let's start out with a discussion of bonds. And we've already talked about these quite a bit as the payee or the, the company that's loaned the money and is now getting paid back. So hopefully it won't be too bad to flip the process and be the company now that is getting the money up front and then having to pay out the interest and the principal later on. So let's break this into steps. First off, we'll calculate the present value of the bond. Then, yes, we get to make a journal entry. And that journal entry includes a credit for the face value of the bond to bonds payable, and then a debit or credit to uh, premium or discount, depending on what we need to show, in a separate account and it's a debit for a discount now and a credit for a premium since it's going to augment this bond payable. And then of course we'll include the cash that we actually get as the last part of that journal entry. Step three is record the interest payments that we make and we'll amortize any premium or discount that we have as part of those journal entries. We can use the effective interest method to calculate interest expense and then back into the amount of premium or discount that's amortized, or we can use the straight line method, figure out the amount of discount or premium amortized, and then back in to interest expense. Let's take just a second and talk about this amortization in a little bit more detail. I know I've talked about this before, but it tends to be a topic that's challenging the first couple times through, so it's probably a good idea that we spend some extra time with it. The basic idea here is that when the final payment is made, the bond has to be completely removed from the company's books. That can't happen if I've still got a premium or discount on my books for that bond. So remember, I'm going to make that final payment, $1 million bond payable, I'm going to pay out a $1 million, that's my journal entry. That premium or discount's got to be gone before I make that payment. So we got to get rid of it somehow. And the way we do it is with one of the two amortization methods. One of them is the straight line method. Now the straight line method means that I take the full amount of the discount or the premium and I divide it by the number of payments. It's kind of like straight line depreciation, hence the similar name. There's just no salvage value. I want it to go to zero. I then take that amount and I'm going to debit or credit premium and discount, whatever I need to get rid of that account, by that amount every single time. So I know the cash amount that I'm going to have to pay that I had to get as part of my present value calculation. I now know the premium or the discount which means that I can back into what interest expense has to be to make my journal entry balance. So with this straight line method, I calculate the premium or discount and back into as a plug figure interest expense. Effective interest method is the opposite. I use the book value of the bonds times the market rate or the effective rate or the discount rate, whatever term you want to use, and that gives me my interest expense. And if I know my interest expense and I know my cash, then I can back into what the premium or discount has to be in order to make the journal entry balance. The other main difference between the two is that straight line is going to be the same every single time because it's straight line. Just like straight line depreciation is the same throughout the whole life of the asset, straight line amortization is the same over the life of the debt. The effective interest method, not so much. It's going to change every time because the more I amortize away, the more the book value changes. And every time the book value changes, I get a new interest expense. So it's going to be different every single time. 
The last difference between these two, the effective interest method is preferred by FASB. The straight line method is allowed if and only if it gives you an interest expense number that is not materially different from what you would get under the effective interest method. So it's allowed, but only if there's not a big difference between the two. Keep in mind these two differences. We're going to play around with both of these. You can see them in action as we go. But knowing the differences between straight line and effective interest is a key concept. It's important to know if you're going to deal with bonds. Let's go back to our steps on recording bonds. And we've talked about these first three. The last step is to record the final payment when the bond matures. And again, that's just going to be a debit to the bond payable and a credit to cash. And of course, a description. And then we'll be done. Whew. Lots of concepts. Let's do an example. I think we really need one. And so here's a company. This is Epistone LLC. They've decided to issue a bond because they're going to, to build a new building. Now, hopefully, the fact that they've sent out this bond to build a new building set off a little warning bells and you went back to our discussion of property plant and equipment and said wait a minute if they take it out for the express purpose of building a building then that becomes the finance chunk of our weighted average calculation in calculating avoidable interest and I don't know if you did that or not I hope you did it's true even though this is not technically a construction loan from a bank that meets all the construction loan obligations it is financing taken out specifically for the building of a physical asset and therefore counts as making it financed. Okay, that's just an aside. Let's go ahead and talk about these three options that Epistone has for issuing this bond. The first bond is to issue an $800,000 annual bond. It'll last for 10 years and pay 12% interest. Bond two is a $950,000 semi-annual bond. It'll go for 12 years at 10% interest. And the last one is a $900,000 quarterly bond It'll last for only five years and pay 15% interest. Now remember, in this case, we're going to be the company, or Episode is going to be the company, paying these percentages. Now, assuming that the market rate on these bonds is 12%, we want to know how are these bonds going to issue. I know you're probably ready to get into the numbers and do some journal entries. I know I'm excited to do journal entries, but I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute. This is the biggest single mistake people make as they're getting into doing bonds and that is they don't take the time to decide up front should this be premium should it be discount should it be par value and if you make a mistake later in doing your time value calculations if you don't know this and have this as a check you won't catch the mistake so please it only takes 15 seconds to go through and decide get in the habit of checking every single time and deciding premium discount, par value, before you move any further. So we are going to take those 15 seconds and go through and decide how each of these bonds should issue. And deciding how they issue, remember, comes down to the current market rate versus the rates that we're paying. Now, we've already talked about this, but just remember, a discount means we're offering less than the market thinks we should, so people aren't going to pay our face value because they don't think we're worth it. If we are offering more than the market thinks we should, then the market's going to be willing to pay a little extra because they want that extra interest. That's a premium. And if we're offering the same interest rate as the market thinks we should be issuing, then they're going to give us exactly what we're asking for. That's a par value. So if you look at these, bond one is offering 12%. Market rate is 12%. So this one's going to issue at par. Bond two is offering 10%. And the market thinks we should be paying 12 so this is going to be a discount bond 3 15 percent market thinks we should be paying 12 so this one's going to be a premium in our next segment we're going to start actually calculating these values and doing some journal entries so make sure you got your financial calculator or excel ready to go or you've got those time value tables ready since we're going to be using them i'll see you then